As fighting continues in Gaza, there's been a growing threat to ships travelling through the Red Sea, one of the world's busiest shipping lanes. Facing attacks from Yemen, many companies have now suspended traffic through the area, thereby disrupting global trade. But while the United States has launched a multinational naval task force to try to tackle the problem, there are concerns that this could fundamentally affect peace and security across the wider Middle East. So, what exactly lies behind the attacks and why is responding so very risky? Hello and welcome. If you're new to the channel, my name is James Carlinzi and here I take an informed look at international relations, conflict, security and statehood. Many conflicts have a destabilising effect on regional peace and security, but occasionally a conflict can also pose a global challenge, for example by interrupting the flow of natural resources or trade. Yemen is an excellent case in point. For almost a decade its brutal civil war has been a threat to regional stability in the Arabian Peninsula. However, it received relatively little international attention. That was until the start of the conflict in Gaza. Since then, it's gained worldwide prominence after the leading rebel group in the country began attacking ships in the Red Sea. But it's not an easy problem to manage. The challenge facing Western policymakers is that tackling the threat to global trade may yet reignite fighting within Yemen and thereby undermine regional peace and security. The Republic of Yemen lies at the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula. Located at the point where the Red Sea, which flows down from the Suez Canal, meets the Arabian Sea and from there the Indian Ocean, it's considered one of the world's most strategically important locations. Indeed, it's estimated that around 30% of the world's container traffic, amounting to around 12% of global trade, uses the waterway. Throughout 2023, it's believed that around 24,000 ships have passed through the Bab al-Mandeb, or Strait of Tears, the narrow passageway separating Yemen from Djibouti and Eritrea across the sea. In terms of population, Yemen has around 30 million inhabitants. While they're almost wholly Muslim and Arab, they're divided into many different tribal groups. On top of this, there's also a religious divide. 30 to 40 percent of the population are Shia Muslims and live mainly in the northwest. The rest are Sunni Muslims spread across the south and the sparsely populated east. Yemen has an exceptionally long history. One of the first areas to adopt Islam in the 7th century, the Ottoman Empire established a presence in the region in the 16th century. But our story really starts in 1839 when the British East India Company seized the port of Aden. From there, Britain extended its influence over the surrounding Sultanates and Emirates. As a result, when the northern areas under Ottoman rule gained independence after the First World War, becoming the Kingdom of Yemen, the south continued under British imperial control. However, by the 1960s, the situation across both parts was becoming increasingly unstable, as Britain prepared for decolonisation an anti-colonial uprising broke out. Meanwhile, after the monarchy was overthrown in the north, a civil war erupted between Republicans and Royalists. But as the decade ended, the situation stabilised. In November 1967, Britain departed and the People's Republic of South Yemen gained independence. Meanwhile, over in the north, now known as the Yemen Arab Republic, the Royalists were all but defeated the following year. From the start, pressure grew for unification. The North, which had always seen British rule as illegitimate, envisaged the creation of a unified Greater Yemen. On top of this, there were also popular calls for a union based on a widespread sense of shared identity. But hopes for a swift merger were short-lived. In June 1969, South Yemen fell under communist rule, becoming the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen. This sparked tensions between the two countries, including a brief border war in 1972. And while they later agreed that their eventual objective was still unification, 
continuing political instability in both countries made further talks impossible and another border conflict erupted in 1979 while the sides again reiterated their wish for union soon afterwards little progress was made for much of the 1980s however by the end of the decade things were changing for the impoverished south the weakening of the Soviet Union, its crucial supporter, made a deal with the economically more prosperous North increasingly attractive. Likewise, over in the North, Ali Abdullah Saleh, the country's president since 1978, was also facing growing economic pressures and saw unification as strengthening his political position. After opening formal discussions in April 1988, the sides unveiled a draft constitution later the following year and on the 22nd of May 1990 the two parts united to create the Republic of Yemen. Despite initial jubilation problems soon emerged. With Saleh now president of a united Yemen the more populous and prosperous north dominated the state. As a result just three years later on the 21st of May 1994 southern leaders unilaterally declared independence sparking Yemen's first post-unification civil war. While the uprising was put down just two months later pro-independent sentiment would continue to linger. After that Saleh continued his autocratic rule. However everything began to change in 2011. Following the start of the Arab Spring, popular protests also erupted in Yemen. But while Saleh initially said he'd step down, he soon reversed his decision. This lasted until he was seriously injured in an assassination attempt a few months later. In February 2012, after over 30 years in power, Saleh resigned, passing control to the Vice President, Abdul Rabu Mansuhadi. At first, there were hopes that the new administration could lead the country in a different direction. But while a democratic convention was created to design a new political order, the administration faced substantial internal problems. Already the poorest country in the Arab world, Yemen's economic situation further deteriorated with high unemployment and food shortages. And like many other countries in the region, it also faced a growing threat from jihadist groups, including offshoots of Al-Qaeda and Islamic State. Meanwhile, down in the south, a pro-independence movement began to gain strength. But the most severe challenge emerged in the north, where an Islamist group called Ansar Allah, better known as the Houthi movement, had been fighting government forces since 2004. Created to protect the interest of Yemen's Shia Muslims, Iran supported the group as part of its broader efforts to destabilise the Gulf. In September 2014, following swift advances, Houthi forces seized the capital, Sana'a. Allying with troops loyal to former President Saleh, within six months they then reached Aden, the new home of the national government, and in March 2015, President Hadi fled the country. It was at this point that the conflict in Yemen escalated dramatically. Fearing that the country was about to fall to Iranian-backed forces, various Arab states, including Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, intervened with the support of prominent Western countries, including the United States, Britain and France. Vowing to end the Houthi threat and reinstate Hadi, the Saudi-led coalition soon made progress against the rebel forces, rapidly retaking much of the south in the months that followed. At the same time, the government forces also allied with the pro-independent southern movement, which was also concentrated on fighting off the Houthi threat. However, this partnership ended in May 2017, when fighting erupted between the allies. Having established the Southern Transitional Council, the STC, to reclaim independence, the Southern Movement seized Aden. Matters were then further complicated when the United Arab Emirates withdrew from the Saudi coalition backing Hadi and switched its support to the STC. By 2018, the situation in Yemen and in the wider region was deteriorating sharply. After the Houthis launched missiles against Saudi Arabia, Riyadh imposed an air and naval blockade on the heavily populated north. 
This left millions in desperate need of food and medical assistance in what became widely seen as the world's worst humanitarian disaster. Later that year, the parties agreed on localised ceasefires to allow in aid. But while the deal was hailed as a breakthrough, it achieved little and the conflict continued. As well as their conflict with the Houthis, the STC and the Hadi government continued to veer between cooperation and conflict. For instance, a Saudi-brokered power-sharing agreement reached in November 2019 had collapsed by mid-2020. But by 2022, the situation appeared to be shifting. Following pressure from Saudi Arabia and the UAE, Hadi agreed to hand over power to a presidential council, thus paving the way for a nationwide ceasefire. Although this lasted just six months, when fighting did resume, it did so at a lower level. This has opened the way for peace talks between the sides and between Saudi Arabia and the Houthis. Perhaps even more significantly, a Chinese-brokered peace agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran at the start of 2023 has also helped to ease tensions. But while this has seen certain positive steps, such as prisoner swaps, the situation in Yemen remains precarious. The UN notes that two-thirds of the population, around 20 million people, still desperately need humanitarian assistance. It's in this context that the war in Gaza poses a significant threat. Following the start of the Israeli attack against Hamas, the Houthis announced that they would attack any ships destined for Israel. Since then, there have been several major incidents. In addition to hijacking a British registered vessel in November, which was towed into a Houthi controlled port, the group has launched numerous drone and missile strikes against shipping. Although many of these attacks were thwarted by US, French and British warships, several hit their targets. Facing a growing danger and rising insurance costs, many large ship owners, including the Danish giant Maersk and the Swiss-owned Mediterranean shipping company, the world's largest container shipping firm, have suspended operations in the region. So too has BP, the oil giant, which operates a fleet of tankers. Needless to say, this interruption to such an important trade route could have significant knock-on effects for the international economy, especially as many countries are just getting control of inflation. And it's this threat to global trade that's prompted the United States to act. On the 18th of December, it announced the creation of a new naval task force, Operation Prosperity Guardian. Made up of 10 countries, the United States, Britain, France, Italy, Netherlands, Canada, Norway, Spain, the Seychelles and Bahrain, it will protect shipping in the Red Sea. Crucially, however, it doesn't include any Red Sea states, nor are there any other Arab states besides Bahrain where the mission will be based. And this points to another greater problem. While the mission may be critical to world trade, there are concerns that it could destabilise the region if not handled carefully. For example, the ongoing peace talks explain why Saudi Arabia, a crucial Red Sea state, has decided not to participate in the mission, and neither has the UAE. Likewise, although there may be a case for launching strikes against the Houthis, it's widely understood that this could upset the delicate situation on the ground in Yemen and see fighting escalate again. Additionally, there are fears that any direct US attack on the Houthis could prompt Iranian retaliation. Tehran has already issued a thinly veiled warning to Washington over this. Asserting his country's dominance in the region, the Iranian defence minister has already said that the US-led task force will face extraordinary problems. Indeed, the United States openly acknowledges the delicate balance between protecting maritime safety and not destabilising the situation in Yemen. To this extent, it seems that for now at least, the United States and others will continue to tread carefully. They'll shoot down any drones or missiles they encounter in the region, but won't try to attack the Houthis directly. But if the situation escalates much further, or the broader economic effects begin to be felt, there may be calls for more direct action. 
This is a development that could potentially plunge Yemen back into its brutal civil war and reignite tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran. I hope you found that useful. If so, here are some more videos that you might find interesting. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next video.